Um, what about that door? I'm not sure if we could close it. We probably could hear somebody approaching better if we didn't. Okay, let's close it. Let's close it. Okay. Let's uh, talk for a few minutes about um, uh, application of technique of uh, change, becoming a new creature. I hate to even use that term because it sounds like some kind of spiritual process. And I guess it is. It's getting rid of the old spirit. <laughs> it's like getting, bringing the new, the new next level stuff. It was uh, interesting to me that in the night um, I was, um, you know, I told you in my night's meeting that I thought that that next level mind probably had the shape of, of, uh, you know, arms and legs and the image that we think of. Is that the mic? Yeah. I'll try to keep my hands off of it. Um, and yet, and now this, you know, sounds crazy and sounds so far out, and it's certainly not uh, information that I'm saying is is gospel. But um, the thought did occur occur to me that next level mind can take on whatever shape that uh, the vehicle um, can take over the shape of the vehicle that will service it for the task that is assigned. <coughs> that. Um, Theoretically, probably then outside of any vehicle that mind could very easily just be a blob, could just be a, if it had no, if it wasn't into a vehicle to function according to the mechanism of the vehicle. Of course, part of the mechanism of the vehicle is, just as a computer has certain hardware, certain software, just like the human animal that we're occupying now has a brain that has certain limitations, certain capacities, <clears throat> the electrical system of it. And that different vehicles have different systems that can handle the task. So the reason, I guess, that that was <clears throat> given to me is because it helped me understand that when what we identified T as, because we, in the time that those who were in the class associated with T in a physical vehicle, we thought, we pictured T as the vehicle that she was wearing, <coughs> that T was wearing, because the vehicle was she, T certainly wasn't she. Um, and yet, the picture I had that when T, when the allotment for the amount of T that was to be given away um, or taken. In other words, I take I take from tea. This is the you know when uh, you take nourishment from your older member, you actually take the mind. <clears throat> you, you, it goes in and it fills you. It's the mind, it's stuff that comes through me and there's an allotment of that mind for this task, like there was an allotment of that mind as far as what was assigned to T's vehicle. Now, I don't necessarily know that all that was in T's vehicle at any given time was all of that allotment, or that if T could draw up on certain amount of other allotment, but when that allotment ran out, then that was all there was for the allotment of that task. But that allotment that was given was not tea at all. It was just that little portion of tea that was allotted for that task that we identified with. So, uh, if there was a little of tea left at the time that the vehicle collapsed, then that little blob just went and added back to the blob that is tea. Do you follow what I'm saying? And would probably have been enough of a blob to add to the vehicle that was T to have in it the memory of the task. So that then T's, because T used to always say that she, um, that there was part of T in spacecraft, um, or there was part of T and O in spacecraft. 
So, uh, it helped, this also, I, you know, this is kind of corny, but a bunch of Jesus' disciples left him when he started saying, you know, unless you eat, drink my blood and eat my flesh, you know, you, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And <clears throat> it was, it was, unless you take that mind, unless you use it as nourishment, unless it becomes a part of you, unless it's the building blocks for your own mind, your possession. It's not really yours, it's next level mind, but it's yours for the time that you have it within your keeping. And like we spoke of last night, unless you abuse it and it is taken from you. What's funny is, even when it is taken from you, there still remains a memory even in the hardware of what was there. And <clears throat> like there's some students now that were in the classroom for an extended period of time and are not in the classroom, and yet they're plagued by what is still in their memory bank. It disturbs them because they even know that they knew it was right and that they knew that it was true. And they try to get rid of it because in order to be comfortable in the world, they don't like to be plagued at this being true because it's conflict, of course, to go back and get comfortable in the world. Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> uh, okay, let's talk about the technique a little bit of ex- expelling uh, mind that is not compatible, mind that we have to abort in order to receive more mind. I, by the way, I uh, I was I felt like I gave a lot away last night. Now I I couldn't have given it away had you not drank it, had you not pulled it in. And uh, in other words, I was trying to give it away, but you took it, and I could feel that a great deal of it was taken from me. And that makes me very very happy for you because. Uh, um, the more that I get away, the closer I'm getting to the completion of my task, and the more you're becoming products that can be viable, or individuals that can be viable and not need to uh, worry about losing your life. As long as you're hooked, when you get, when you can stay hooked on the next level, and that's all you want, and you're hooked on your older members, and you're hooked on others who are doing this, and there's such a bond there, such a new grafting that has taken place, and you're hooked, then you're in an excellent position to grow very quickly and to receive a lot. And you... Whoops. Uh, Okay, I, I still haven't gotten around to what I want to talk about. And I said that 60-minute tape would be adequate. <laughs> uh, um, okay, some real practical application. I think what you want to get in the regular habit of doing is start sustaining a consciousness 24 hours a day of examining the quality of what's in your head. Uh, examining is, uh, are the thoughts that I'm thinking compatible with my older member's mind? Are they thoughts of the next level, or are they thoughts of the world? In other words, am I, is it a mixture that's all in water and doesn't mix? And therefore, in other words, examine what is in your mind. Examine what is in the impulses of the animal that you're wearing. So, and this can be done, this primarily has to be done in your silence. It doesn't do any good. You don't have to go sit and, you know, twiddle your thumbs or be in a meditative state. But it's, it's wherever you're, whatever you're doing, wherever you're going, whatever you're doing, um, fiber lab or vital signs or working in the consumer lab, if you will examine the quality of the thoughts that are passing through your head and make a habit of examining them and sorting them out 
this is appropriate, this is inappropriate, this is, and aborting those things that are not. Now, how do I abort? <clears throat> um, you have to, it's, you have to kind of format your uh, language and the strength of impression behind your language so that just as you would have a delete key on the computer, you when you say get out or good night, I don't want that, you know, stop it. Get get out of here. Now get out of here is probably one of the most used <laughs> phrases in our in our uh, whole uh, word processing. And now, first of all, we probably recognize it and we say, oh, good night. I didn't realize what I was entertaining. Uh, and so when you, you're, when it becomes distasteful and you recognize it is not compatible with next level mind or older member's mind, then you immediately delete. And if you say, get out, actually run it out. It, it is like, um, it is like a presence that can be run out. I, I, I won't call it a living presence because I can't really think that the mind of this world, as Seeker said, it's, this is living matter that you're putting in there now. That's not living matter. But nevertheless, it is, it is a blob of information that does respond to your command in the same way that spirits are run off when you, when you, uh, exercise spirits or whatever it is, uh, you have to actually give commands for that thought to leave you. If the thought doesn't leave you, then give the command again and keep giving the, name, the command. If you have to verbally uh, allowed, um, say, get out of here, do it. You know, try not to let the whole block hear what you're <laughs> saying, but if you have to verbalize it, do it. Have no hesitation about it. Your partners will certainly know what's going on. They will be very comfortable with your saying, get out of here, you know, because you're going to hear them doing the same thing, and I'll be worried about them if they aren't doing the same thing. So, uh, filter, examine. What is in your head? Habitually examine the vibration of what is your what is in your head. Now, just clutter is just as much a detriment to you as very distasteful things. Just clutter, like uh, stuff that is of no value. You know, running old tapes, running old tapes of old you know, jobs that your vehicle had back in the world, or old tapes of of um, um, other members of the litter of the animal you're wearing, or old tapes, just anything of the world. Old tapes of something you saw on television, or old, you know, just clutter. Because when clutter is in there, then you're listening to it. You can't help but listen to it. It's noise. It's noise. Even if you aren't paying that much attention, it's noise. When you have noise in here, then you can't listen. You're not really in a condition of asking and listening. So to start off with, you've got to get the screen blank. One way you're going to get the screen blank is to abort and abort and abort to the screen blank. Now it's going to be hard for some of you to learn to sustain blank without it being a hard blank. Now what I mean by uh, a hard blank, uh, when you have a hard blank, and it's hard for good stuff to come in. When it's a clear, when it's just clear, I hate to use that term, though, because of any of these est and other uh, methods, you know, uh, Scientology and all these, are, you know, you just get clear. What is it that Scientology uses that... Uh, um e no, uh, they say, reactive what kind of, yes, the reactive mind. <laughs> if you can get rid of the reactive mind. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a lot of truth to that. A lot of truth to that. Because just the, the impulses of the vehicle, are, that's reactive mind. And it, the vehicle sees something, it starts a little problem, and goes across the screen. Goes across the screen. 
And you, you, you just let it pass because you've never disciplined yourself to not let it pass. And so you have to keep examining that screen. Is there clutter in there? Is there garbage in there? If it isn't distasteful, is it just unnecessary? Because I can't really be in a position where I can ask for things and expect to begin to get answers if I am, if I have clutter there. Eyes are a major aspect of control with the brain. Control of the eyes. Uh, when your animal that you're wearing was out in the world, it was free to look at anything. And we uh, humans do not discipline what they let it look at. Some are uh, uh, more invasive and, you know, it's staring even to the point of embarrassing others because people are aware that they're staring. Others will glance out of the side of their eye and you know by the quality of the glance that the thought wasn't too desirable of a thought. But controlling the eyes, learning to, when the eye, and the eyes, believe it or not, will go to something that the vehicle is attracted to without giving you any signal. I mean, there is no signal there, just the eyes will go to it. And suddenly you think, what in the world are you going to that for? Because the animal is just responding that way. Now, if we're going to break this horse, and we're going to make it respond only when we give it signals, then we have to catch it in the act of everything that it does. So that it is, the eyes aren't just darting wherever the eyes want to dart. You have to make it. You, and you will find that that animal you're wearing, when you make the eyes go this way, it'll go, you know, it'll try to prove to you that it'll only be obedient for a second and then it'll get its eyes back over there. And you, so you have to force it. And so this is a practice that you can do even when there isn't much attraction for the eye. When it's just even a mild attraction for the eye to go here. And I mean attraction of even if it's something that it's admiring as senior or whatever it is that the eye wants to go to, then don't let the eye go there. Learn to make the eye look where you tell it to look. And uh, so when it darts back or it wants to get that last glance, or, you know, a good exercise, if, if somebody's walking down the street on a bicycle or something, you're going down the car, and the eye wants to go to it, just because of motion, the eye will even be attracted to what it is that's going down the side of the road. And as soon as you recognize the eye is wanting to go there, force the eye to keep its eye. And don't even let the eye look through peripheral vision. Now, if necessary, look far enough away that there is no peripheral vision. Don't even let it get away with peripheral vision of what it wants to look at. Now, this is the beginning of discipline of the eyes and what you permit to go through the head. You don't get anywhere if you don't engage this. Uh, Talodi has had to work with a genetic uh, computer that is a very rough uh, uh, discipline for him because genetically his computer, if he would let it, would just talk to its agent. There was nothing to say. It would just talk, run old tapes and his mouth would want to move and and then it'll pace if it, if it, if it uh, you know, is restless, it'll want to pace and it'll talk and pace and it'll look and look and, you know, and that's, and that's a rough, uh, vehicle to have to quiet down and calm down and calm down to the point where you're not an explosive that is bottled up. You know, this isn't calming down. <laughs> you know, uh, it's avoiding that restlessness so that when you are still, there's not an explosion about to happen. It's avoiding the restlessness, telling it to get out so that you can be calm. You don't have to let the machinery just, you know, run like a, what is it, a screensaver? Mm -hmm. You know, some of you have... Uh, just screens there, just going all the time. <laughs> and if it's, uh, oh, what's his name, Joe? 
that's Johnny Castaway. You know, he's in motion all the time. And that's the way your brain will be if you let it be that way. So we have to exercise. And you can make a game of it. You can enjoy the practice of controlling the eyes. You can control the ears. Now, the ears aren't nearly as difficult a problem as the eyes. But the ears will... It depends upon the addictions of the vehicle. If the vehicle was attracted to certain rhythms or sounds of music or or um, sounds of human voices or whatever it is, then you have to deal with that too. It's, you're not letting the ears hear only what the ears want to hear. Uh, or what you're demanding the ears to hear instead of what the ears want to hear. So the ears are much milder discipline. The hands are a rougher discipline than the ears. The hands want to do things that you don't want the hands to do. The vehicle's hands like to do things you don't want it to do. Whether it's reach out and caress someone, or caress the vehicle that you're wearing, and I'll use some very crude terminology here that uh, I think does me a favor, but and can do you a favor. But one of the major things that we deal with is getting the vehicle under control as far as sensuality is concerned. And sensuality to me is almost too dignified of a term for the animal behavior. And I almost feel like about the only thing that really works is to just think of it as the vehicle wanting to play with its pee-pee. Now, now, laugh with me on that. Don't get heavy duty with me on that. Now, I'm serious. Uh, if you get heavy duty, then the vehicle is... Oh my goodness, how could those say something is cruising? But to me, that plumbing is a pee-pee. You know, it's plumbing. It's it's to get rid of fluid that because you, you have too much water or or juices it, and it's just a it's plumbing for fluid. And if you can think of it, the the animal that you're wearing is such a baby that all it wants to do is still play with its pee-pee <laughs> when it gets into sensuality. It puts it in a different department. And you feel like slapping the darn thing because it's just at that level. You don't want to elevate it by taking of its sensory things or sexuality or romance or whatever. You know, all these glorified terms for playing with its productive or reproductive arts. You know, when the Lord gave the command to go and multiply, he was talking to the horses, not the riders. They were talking to the horses, not the riders. Riders come in when it's time to take over the horses. And it's totally inappropriate. When there is a rider, their reproduction is out of the question. I mean, and any of the activity that went with reproduction is out of the question once a rider has been assigned to a horse. And a, a rider has no instruction in that department. None. It is it is insulting to the rider to think in the in the thoughts of of reproductivity or satisfying the senses by uh, uh, activity that was uh, pornographic to the next level to begin with. One of the worst things that Luciferians even brought into this world was changing reproduct act reproductive activity into hedonistic activity, just satisfying the senses. And now even churches are putting out books upon the value of masturbation and things of that. I don't know if you're aware of it, but the Lutheran Church recently put out a, a manual on... I don't know, there's several Lutheran churches, you know, the Missouri Senate and this and that, and I don't know what all they are. But when I read of that, I was appalled that they could think that something of that was a value. Yeah. As a value, as against what? You know, I don't know uh, what the alternative would be. But for us, we, that kind of, now don't get heavy duty on me, you know, don't get serious on me. Keep this as what it is. Keep it as childish, as trite, as beneath you activity. 
Don't, if you get serious, then you, you can easily be victimized by thoughts of that nature. They are, they it is animal behavior. Well, when you see an animal, do you get heavy and say, oh my goodness, I'm an animal. You know, <laughs> the little counter spaniel, you know, coming up and looking at you, you say, oh, terrible vibration animal. No, I mean, it's, a, no, it's silly. It's just a little puppy. And if you would treat this animal that you're wearing as some, that its impulses are just silly and ridiculous and beneath you, and when it tries to respond that way, then you just go right to its its uh, information center and say, stop it, That's not, I'm not going to permit that behavior. Uh, I'm in here, you know. This is, I'm in here, you know, I'm the rider here. And you do only what I direct you to do, and that kind of behavior is totally inappropriate. Now, it will challenge you, and challenge you, and challenge you, until it knows you meant what you were saying. And, uh, you have not gotten anywhere in that particular department until it knows you mean business. When you, when you participate in the kind of drunkenness that, now I mean literal drunkenness, the act of reproduction, the act of a sensuous act, lowers your, your vibration right down to animal level. Any decent mind that was in your package had to abort to even permit you to do that. And the recovery time from that act, after you have permitted yourself to participate in that animal act, is a difficult recovery time. So the faster you get a hold of this and learn to do what it, do whatever it takes to get a hold of it. I mean, let's say you're attacked in the middle of the night. Don't get heavy duty about it. But if it's trying to attack you and you're tempted to getting heavy duty about it, go wake up your partner and say, partner, sit up here and talk to me or let's, let's do, let's go read together. Let's uh, write, make some note together. Let's do something about it. Help me out here. I, you know, I'm just about to lose control. I don't know what's going on with this stupid animal I got here that, that wants to keep my thoughts preoccupied in this nature. And because this act is as difficult of an addiction as any heroin or morphine or any drug that you can think of to break if your vehicle wasn't accustomed to participating in this to any significant degree. So, and that's what causes such an addiction because the, the vehicle likes the buzz even though it was never intended to be designed for that. So, uh, uh, we're not going, this is, as far as I can tell, I hope I don't have to repeat this kind of discussion, because I don't like, to me, it lowers my vibration to talk about these things with you. And I'm sure it's lowering yours because of the thoughts that flash through your mind when I have to talk about these things. But I want you to learn that if you can stay light, if you can consider ridiculous, and keep it beneath you. You can consider it a puppy activity that, that, why would you want to do what the puppy wants to do? I mean, are we that low that we have to let the puppy tell us what it wants to do? And that we then have to struggle to return to the vehicle that the puppy has just knocked its uh, thermometer down to, you know, nothing's in the, there's no mercury in the tube just because of what the puppy, we let the puppy do. Uh, okay. Uh, you know, when you begin to see, when you get payoff for discipline, when you can control what is in your head, control what your eyes are doing, and you can ask for what you need, because you can always ask the next level, at any time, for what you need. Now, they don't always give you what's pleasant. They'll give you what you need. And frequently what you need is another test in this department or that one. In order for you to show that you are developing. What they want is developed muscle against 
animal behavior. Muscle that proves that the only thing I want in my container is the mind of the next level that comes through members of the next level. Because I want to be a member of the next level. Now, a member of the next level is someone who can sustain being a member of the next level by staying dependent upon its graft and sustaining the behavior that binds. No, it just was thirty. Okay. okay. <laughs> The one thing you have to work so hard at is the old habit. When you in the human world, vehicles are in the habit of putting forth one face when they're with their loved ones, or they're with their teachers, or they're with at the church, or wherever. They put forth one face, and then when they're off by themselves, there's another face. Or when they're with somebody that they like to gossip with, then there's a third face. You know, all this little pettiness that goes on. And then if they're off in their closet or in their bathroom and they like to play with their silly vehicle, then there's another thing. And you, you've got to be one face. You've got to be just as close to your older member. Sounds crude. When you're sitting on the pot or you're bathing your body in the shower, just as close to your older member, that your older member would be just as pleased with the way you're treating that task you're doing right then. Just as pleased with where your head is and where your vibration is and keeping it there. Now, so get in the habit of examining the quality of your thoughts, not during the peak days when you're, you know, those, those time of the days that it's easy to think about the higher stuff, uh, we all have times of the day that it's easier to think about the higher stuff. The hard thing to do is think about the higher stuff when the vehicle wants to think about the lower stuff. Now, it has become a habit in most human vehicles to think about the lower stuff the darker it gets. And in the middle of the night. Some reason or other, that's just kind of a habit that it likes to do. Or when it's all has stuff. Okay. One of the remedies we try to do is not to want to be, not to get separate. You want to learn to get very uncomfortable separate. There's nothing wrong with using your partnership and using your other crew members as reinforcement for your sustaining the next level vibration. Use their presence there. When you're dealing with something, tell your partner. <coughs> Your partner should be telling you, and you should be telling your partner, if you see anything about me that is not next level, I want to know about it. I want to know, I really want to know about it. And so they tell you, and then you get defensive, and they, and you say, well, I'm going And they say, well, I thought you said, I want to know about it. It doesn't sound like you wanted to know about it. And so at that time, then hop right back in there and say, you're right. I apologize for being defensive. That was the animal talking. I'm glad you told me. Because you wouldn't have told me had there not been some truth to what you were observing. And I'm put to the test. I don't want that which you're bringing up to me. So depend upon your partners and depend upon your classmates. And it is your duty to comply with their requests and their wishes when your partner asks for help and tell them. Don't just say, well, I'll tell them maybe tomorrow the next day when you're a little better friend than mine. <laughs> You've lost two days. When you're in a better friend than mine, not, there's no progress that gets made. When I'm in a good friend of mine, I don't have, there's no work to accepting help. When I have, when I'm being helped, and it's hard for me to accept help, and I change in order to be accepting of that help, turn immediately and apologize to them for my poor response, and thank them for it, then change, I'm making progress. Change is occurring. I'm forcing the vehicle to break its habit of defensive responses, and its reluctance to accept criticism. 
you need to, you're not going to get anywhere if you don't, at a very accelerated pace, get in a mode where you like criticism, where you welcome criticism, and you get beyond responding defensively. Don't you want to know if there's anything about you that differs from the next level or your older members? You say, yes, when you're sitting in church. You know, but what about the rest of the time? We've got to, uh, uh, we can't have, you know, periods of the day when we're the good guys and other periods when we're the bad guys. This technique is really, really, really valuable to you. If you do not exercise it, the very areas that are your problem areas will not change. As long as those problem areas remain, they will be areas that put separation between you and other members of the college. You and your classmates to certain degrees, and certainly to your other members. When you have this animal under control so much so that it does not leak of any animal characteristics, and you can sustain that around the clock, and you have restraint and willingness and a pleasant countenance, and you are ready and willing to do whatever they would have you do, why? I'll tell you, I know how much I would enjoy having you in my presence. Because I can feel that. But even if you are that during a period of the day and you let your vibration go way down during other periods of the day, you still bring some of that lower quality with you even during the peaks of that day. In other words, you have to establish a track record. You've got to get past any regularity of letting destructive or negative thoughts occupy your head or letting your hands get where they shouldn't or your eyes go where they shouldn't are entertaining thoughts that are inappropriate. The hardest thing, some of you are already writing CSRs and telling me, as far as I'm aware, I have not had negative thoughts, and I read those and I say, then you're fine. Frequently I read those reports and I know that you're fine. Not, you're not saying that, you're not lying to me, but you're not even aware of how much negative thought that you have that is still negative. Because it's not as negative as it used to be. <laughs> so the new measure of it is that I'm not aware that I've entertained negative thoughts. I entertain negative thoughts. I fight negative thoughts. Every day, all the time, I fight negative thoughts. But don't forget, my microscope is ten times more powerful than yours. And I keep my, I keep it right down as low as I can get it with the most magnification. And that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to increase the magnification of the characteristics that still try to be present with you that differ from the next level. So spend time several times a day reviewing techniques. Filtering out, learning to sort out what, is, what am I permissive of in my head. Clutter old tapes to run, imagery, things that are animal, that are of this world, not of the next world. Can I, am I comfortable remaining calm? Can I be comfortable? Can I be pleasant? And can I be alert and keen? I'm not only alert and keen when I'm so hyper that all kinds of static is coming through my head. <coughs> you don't want to be so subdued in your calm that a bit of tiredness can come in, or laziness, or slovens. You can stay keen and alert and pleasant without being too much one way or too much the other. Okay. That's all I'm going to do. This is the extent of this little me. I know you fine. Right. Which many of you will at times when you're when you're fighting battles of doubt and battles of that it could you know, is this just another bunch of poppycock or another religious approach and 
and you know, Doe's well meaning, I'm sure Tiva's well meaning. Uh, no matter what form your doubts can come to you, you because doubts used to attack T and me probably more than the students. Because we would we we didn't want to have anybody on the trip. We didn't want to we were to mislead anyone or be the instruments of misleading someone. So we were constantly doubting ourselves. And then but even when we were when we would listen to that doubt of being right down to nothing, that nothingness still said we cannot do other than this. This is all there is to us. That if this is not reality, then as far as we can tell, this is as close to reality as we can get. That this is, now I'm talking doubt. I'm talking doubt. This is not the way my mind, the word, process, the word processor works. But at lowest moments, it's like there is nothing else at those lowest moments. This is like uh, 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 you, will, you can scream to the next level and say if there is. Now, I'm afraid T and I still scream to the next level. We didn't scream to, you know, call some other creature in to, to try to lead us astray. Of course, the, the next level very safely took us through this because they had us examine every concept that you could get sidetracked on, every concept that you could get hooked on along the way, whether it was every religious idea, every Eastern religion, every New Age thing that you could possibly examine. We went into, I mean, we went into in earnest and practiced everything we could think of to practice, and at a very accelerated pace learned, this isn't it. This is not what I, I'm after. It, it's a dead end. It doesn't lead me where. So wherever this finds us, this is where we must put our whole effort. And um, when we get to that point, then the influences don't like it when you are at that point. Because they know they can't have you. That the worst thing they can do to you is maybe have you weakened for a period. Have you down to the place where all you're saying is, well, I don't care. I don't care what exists. This is my, if I have a chance, this is my best chance. If there is a chance for me to be of some service to Whatever there is, you know, I mean, otherwise I have to believe there is not. I have to believe that a totally agnostic view, of a completely, uh, you know, uh, this vehicle used to spend a lot of time with Unitarians and uh, uh, associated a lot and worked in Unitarian churches and uh and I could not believe that the individuals were willing to accept that all there is is what I pass on to my offspring. That that uh, that the only extension of me is what goes on in that offspring, and that that is all there is. And that when this life is over. I can say, well spent, I did the best I could do as a good humanitarian, bye-bye. You know? I couldn't buy that. I mean, I couldn't, I did, not in my wildest dreams could I buy that. I could not believe that, I mean, to me, all I have to do is go at an observation window and surgery and see what's going on with, even as a doctor, uh, you know, works on a human vehicle and see the absolute magic of even this crude animal they were wearing to see the kind of invention that it is. And uh, I can't, and my wildest dreams believe that just happened. <laughs> you know, it just happened, not by design, not by some uh, department in some level 
greater and higher than human mind who know better and know better. I can't do my things I know even at my weakest moments. I can't deny them. So, uh, I hope this has been helpful to you in what you might have to deal with. Now, sometimes all of these things just seem like fanciful ideas, when maybe what you deal with the most is just the pangs of the vehicular separation from the other parts of its planks of the vehicle, or the pangs of old indulgences that used to give certain satisfaction, or the pangs of just not, of the fun of just running wild, how much fun it was to just run wild instead of being a part of a unit that functioned as a unit. That's a big adjustment, to function as a unit. Particularly when you work so hard, some of you in the world, to learn to not let others impose upon you, and you finally become independent, and then you become of something that doesn't want independence. Even though next level won't let us get rid of a certain degree of volition, or choice of will. And therefore we, even though we would like to be totally dependent on that stuff, next that would mean you don't do any work on your own. You don't do any other on your own. Okay. Um, yes, go ahead. Is this go a good time to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Laguni was talking about a hologram, analogy of, <clears throat> of this planet and possibly you know, this universe as being a kind of a hologram like what was in one of those Star Trek movies where they had a whole civilization or a whole, I think it was a planetoid that had a whole community that was a projection from this machine. And I'm trying to get that straight in my head. Well, uh, uh, if something serves a purpose and works as a design as to whether or not it can be wiped out uh, at pushing a button within a lab in the next level. And all of it was really something that... I, now, let's take a hologram situation like in Star Trek. Let's say you go to the holodeck and you can experience things. And while you're on the holodeck, it's real. And those are real experiences and real lessons. And you're actually in the time of the hologram. And therefore, everything in it matches with the lesson of that time and that period. What of what value is it to th to think it has to be of hard matter that could not be wiped out? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And uh, because I believe that the next level is completely capable of pushing a button, wiping it out. Okay. Now I think that they have on their keyboard though, they've got one red button over here that could wipe out a whole galaxy, you know, if they wanted to. But they have also, you know, lesser buttons that can wipe out all the plants on planet Earth if they're going to. If they wanted to just quickly recycle planet Earth. So that it was sent then the nutrients to be a garden again. But I believe that they can actually, they just, and they evaporate. It's just like it can be designed so it's just not there anymore. And it's restored to a ball of water that had a, had a rectangular body, matter of of earth, and then it separated and separated as purpose for it was there to separate, and it served the function of a fertile garden. This fertile garden, I can't believe otherwise, is due a recycling. I mean, it is spent. It it is so. Uh, 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 it has been so destroyed, its environment, the mind that is on the planet, everything about it is needs recycling. And so, uh, uh, why not? I mean, what's the big deal? They, uh, the next level, anything that is of value on the planet, I think they also have a button to pull off anything of value that they want to keep. Just like you do on your computer. You can, tab certain things that you can extract from there and then delete everything else. And anything that is of any value that they want to save, I think they can easily extract and then everything else evaporates. And then they start afresh. And a new crop of Luciferians 
come in. Because the old one has no use anymore. They've gotten too perverted. Does that, does that mean in any way that the Luciferians themselves could be part of the program? A part of the hologram? Oh, absolutely. Uh, they're kind of like... Nothing gets out of the hologram except that which gets into the next up. As far as I'm concerned, nothing gets out of it except what gets into the next step. So is really just a bug in the hologram that you have to keep fighting against. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. When you separate from the next level, when you separate from the next level, either the next level separates you, or you separate, then they have a choice when they do separate you, whether they have purpose in keeping you. In other words, letting you serve a certain purpose, even as a negative. But when you separate, then there is no life in you. There is no truth in you. There is no no part of them. But you are separate and can serve a purpose for them in certain developments of gardens. Okay. Oh, it's just a tiny problem. I wonder how long it took him to figure out uh, when, he, when he got kicked out uh, how, how, how much he didn't know, how much he didn't take into consideration. When he got stuck there, he tried to, tried to put vehicles together and they wouldn't work and he couldn't get them, they didn't have eternal life and he couldn't work. <laughs> Uh, say your question again. Well, I wonder how long after he was booted out, he kind of think, you know, he thought he knew a lot of things. How long did it take him to figure out, here's the little things I didn't know, and how long it took him those things to catch up with him and him? Well, uh, I'm not sure. Uh, he would have to have some more good mind in him to know the limits of what he didn't have. I mean, to know that he was restricted. So he probably still works at thinking that he might be able to accomplish what he has in mind accomplishing. Had he known the truth and not had ignorance had him separate, he would have never separated in the beginning. So he had to separate at a degree of ignorance, of thinking that, you know, I'm tired of this monarchy, I'm going to go for my own monarchy. But I don't believe that happened as much as the next level says, I've had it with you. And you're out of here. And uh, then in order to exist, you have to exist defensively. I mean, you have to defend your position. You have then to create the world with what you are capable of drawing upon. And of course, what he was capable of drawing on is extremely limited by next level standards. And he has to use, he has to make concoctions and use um, uh, things that were never designed to be used the way he uses them. Therefore, the end product is always a mess. Okay. Okay, so nice question. Okay, so I just—it was an observation. It probably exposed my eyes running out of control. But I noticed a bumper sticker the other day that said "Restore Wanda Wanda Land." I thought that was pretty appropriate, which that's I think a term that they use for the little rectangular earth. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's interesting. Okay, see you.